All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, or sorry, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, welcome back to another Rust Game Dev Meetup. It's been quite a while. Um, I put it off two weeks because I had a thing, and then I had COVID, and now now we're here. Um, and I was looking at it, and I'm like, okay, well, are we too close to the next meetup to run one? Uh, but I'm like, nah, I nah, will put one on anyways. And uh, I'm really happy that we did because we have uh, three awesome speakers today who are going to be telling us about um, some stuff that they are working on. And so uh, we'll have uh, Elham talking to us about Blue Engine. We'll have uh, Andrea talking to us about Cybersoul. And we'll have Capri talking to us about um, no SCD for game development. And this, this, so, I mean, we'll, we'll get to all of the stuff, but I'm very excited for all three of them. Um, I think it's going to be a, a pretty exciting uh, meetup. And of course, if, uh, as always, you want to, to show something off, um, I try to make sure that we get a lot of people in who are working on a lot of cool things. I use uh, GitHub issues to just track who's going to be uh, presenting. And so, uh, and I'm, I want to do better for October. I want to make sure that we get like a um, pretty large crowd. I need to like put down a list of everybody who's working on cool stuff so I can like reach out to them more easily. Um, I kind of just like ping a few people every once in a while. But anyways, um, uh, also to add, we're, we're currently still working on the August Rust Game Dev newsletter. Um, if you have anything you want to add to that, I, th I think it might be pretty close to getting published right now, um, but uh, you can always uh, go and check out the development of that. I think I can navigate to it quickly. Uh, we have the uh, website right here. We got like this big tracking issue uh, with all the stuff that's going on. Um, okay, actually, actually, I think it's like in a place that um, people can uh, still contribute items to it. So um, anyways, uh, we're here to talk about the cool stuff we've been working on. Um, I haven't been doing too too much in the game dev space uh, for the the last month, but what I have been doing, and I mean it's not like a, a really cool thing, but like I've been like doing more with Rust embedded. Um, I'm having a ton of fun with like ESP devices and mesh networking. And um, what I want to try and do is for Halloween have like a lot of ESP devices. Like ESPs are like this little chip right here. Uh, so actually, I can like do much better than this. I can go. There we go. Yeah, yeah. So we got like this little chip up here. Uh, I want to like connect it to like several other um, of the same chip, and then have this cool like light show going on. And so I'm doing some prototyping. Um, and Rust embedded is like so much fun. Um, I, I thought that I didn't like embedded because it looked like all complex and low level and everything. And then uh, you start working on parts of it, and you get some pretty cool stuff going on. Um, and also, I mean, oh, you you start to appreciate the type system a lot in in different ways. But anyways, I digress. Um, oh, I see a question in chat. Are you using Embassy? I don't think so. Um, I'm, I'm at the point where it's like you follow whatever tutorial is there, and then it gives you like this hardware abstraction level kind of stuff, like HAL. Um, and, and then like you go a level above that into like the IDF, which stands for IoT Development Framework, which then stands for Internet of Things Development Framework. Okay, anyways. Um, so lots, lots of fun stuff to learn in there. 
But let's hop back into game dev. Uh, we have a lot of uh, really awesome talks for today. And so uh, we will be back in uh, just a moment here. Let me just fix my screen before I get started on this. Um, back in just a moment with uh, Blue Engine. All right, so Elham, it's been a few months. Um, I don't remember the last time we, uh, we got to hear about Blue Engine, um, but I see that we have a, a pretty big update for today. So I'll hand it over to you uh, to take it away. Uh, hello, everybody. I hope you're doing well. It has been some months, as I said before, but Blue Engine have evolved a lot in these past few months. And we finally have the 0.5 update, which was a big change and a big update. We had over 23, I think 37 even updates, smaller um, commits and feature changes. So it is a pretty big update for the engine and it has come a long way ever since I've started it. Uh, we'll go over the list of updates um, right now. Okay, so first of all, we'll talk about, about the update itself, uh, what it means for the engine. The second one is documentation, which I've been evolving a lot recently, but I'm pretty lazy on it. Uh, we'll talk about transparency, resource sharing, uh, smaller changes that has been happening in the engine. And we have a, a good news with the engine, which is somebody is making video games with it now. Uh, I'm pretty surprised by it, but I've been really excited about it since. Uh, so let's get started. The update itself, it has been uh, in development for a lot of months, I think over half a year. And there was a lot of changes in the engine. The main idea with 0 0.5 was me having an idea or like a goal with the engine to get to reach a place where it is usable, basically. So to get to there, I have I was having a lot of plans and smaller tasks to do and things and features that should be available in the engine. So by 0 0.5 update, I have achieved pretty much almost all of them. And because of that, I've released uh, a final update like 0 0.5. So what does this mean about the engine? It means that the engine is finally starting to be usable into the, the projects. So if you have a project that needs a smaller engine to be like extendable, be small and doesn't get in your way, Blue Engine is now possible to be used in those areas. Uh, it could even be used in like smaller projects or even like embedded systems, but I'm still working on it. It has now great cross-platform support. It's working pretty much everywhere, including mobile. Uh, I have yet to make sure web is uh, compilable, but that'll, that'll be coming on soon. And on the other side, we are, I've been working on making more tutorials and documentation on it, which I've been, I will be releasing pretty soon. I'm also planning on video tutorials for it, so uh, pretty exciting things, to be honest. Um, let's start with documentation. Blue Engine was suffering a lot from documentation. There was very small amount of readable material, and there was also like not really good like code level documentation. So if you search some function app and stuff, it was really lacking in that department. By now, the Blue Engine has every single function of the engine documented and every single feature documented. So you can like check up whatever you want on docs.rs. And the engine is also being, uh, we have a little guide for the engine uh, on a separate uh, repository, which I'm working on to like make it up to date with the 0 0.5 update. Uh, it will have not, it will not be talking specifically about the engine like internally, rather what you can use with it. For example, games and examples and things like that. Um, that will be coming on soon, so expect that too, but still a work in progress. I haven't like posted updates on it yet, so I'm working on it. The second day is transparency, which was a big issue for the engine. I've spent like a good couple of weeks to fix this, but now the engine has like really good transparency supports uh, between textures and also like the engine components itself. So this means that you can use like however many 2D or 3D objects that you want and have like full transparency and alpha channels on it. It doesn't sound big, but it was <laughs> big enough for the engine because it was really hard to achieve it, especially on the scale that, uh, that it should be flexible enough. The other thing is resource sharing, which I'm really excited about this because uh, it is quite a new feature for the engine and it opens a lot of ways. 
So what this means is basically you can now have references to the resources that other objects have. In this example, you can see the object one has, for example, shaders, textures, vertices, and stuff like that. So for example, you have one object to hold, uh, for example, a tile in your 2D game. And you don't want to like instance it or have like a lot of different properties or make or copy it to make different um, different objects, like for example, multiple objects having same resources, which was a problem previously because in the API that we use, you cannot like copy things around. You can only uh, straight up like own it because ownership is required uh, to use the API. So to resolve this, I've implemented object sharing. So what it means is basically an object will have will either have the resources itself or reference it to an object that does have the resources. So this could mean, for example, you have one object with, with um, a blue texture and then other objects can straight up reference to that texture. And on runtime, like when rendering the objects, the reference will be checked to see if the resource exists or not, or if it doesn't, or if it is referenced, it will fetch the thing that it is referenced from. So it's a basically a checking up to like the source, uh, the source object that has the original resources. Um, I think it can help a bit with, um, it's pretty much like instancing, but with greater control because you have more control on the object, object itself. Uh, but yeah, I'm excited on the implications that how this will be used. It has been used in tiling management and stuff like that, but uh, I'm excited on how people will use this one. The next one is some smaller changes. Um, we have backends now being selectable, so you can manually select the backend that you want for the engine, for the engine to run. Previously, it was automatically chosen per platform, so if you don't want to support a specific backend, you can manually select it right now. Orthogonal perspective is now available for some 2D games and 3D renders that require it. Render order is now available for, or if you want to like have some objects being rendered first. Previously, uh, a walk around was to change the z-axis for 2D games, but now you can straight up use render order to make some objects appear on the front than in the back. The final th small change is shader build, shader builder, which basically is a struct that can help you alter and manipulate shader code uh, during runtime. So you can write a normal shader code for the engine in WGSL and then alter some functionality for it. So for example, in the engine, we have camera effects, which is a feature. You can like turn off camera affecting the objects. And this can in runtime be altered using shader builder. Uh, I'm excited on how that will be used too, because I'm using it on lighting, camera effects and things like that. Uh, examples will be posted uh, with time goes. And finally, the exciting news uh, is people are starting to build video games with the engine. Um, and specifically on Discord community server, we have Pablo Zero, which is making a 2D game with the engine. Uh, he's planning on sharing resources and the code that he's been using uh, soon once the game is built enough. Uh, and also he's working on a tiling manager for the engine. So it is pretty exciting news for the engine itself because it shows that it is usable now, finally. And one of the proof would be this one, this game. Uh, I would like to have some special thanks at the end, uh, Pablo Zero for amazing usage of the engine. It, he has opened my eyes on many of the issues that the engine had. Uh, that I have not addressed or even uh, noticed. Gibson62, which is now on the community staff member, he has helped a lot with the resources and documentation and like guiding the new users with the engine. So I'm thankful thankful for him. And on GitHub, a Koei SK no block, I hope I have not butchered the name, but he has helped a lot with the uh, some some of the recent updates, for example, orthogonal perspective was added by him, render order and stuff like that. So these are the people I'm really thankful for, for the 0 0.5 update. And with that, we will end the talk.
uh, if you have any question, make sure to write it up. The link on the engine and all the community servers and everything is on below the questions. So feel free to check it out. Awesome. Yeah, very cool to see all these updates. I do have uh, one question in chat and then one for myself. And so uh, in chat, we have what problems does the shader builder solve and what are its capabilities? So one of the problems for me that I had was shader, shaders usually like I was writing it inside the code itself, for example, the Rust code. And it had a lot of problems for me, basically like having the indentation and like debugging it outside of it because I use VS code. I have a lot of extensions for the shaders. So I moved it out to a separate file. And now I had another problem because like I said, I had a feature which you can turn off the camera effects for a specific object. Um, for example, if you don't want camera to alter your transformation and stuff like that, you can turn it off in the settings. And if you have shaders outside, you gotta have like two versions of the same shader to like accommodate for camera being off or on. So shader builder basically takes the code and then how let you have conditions on the on the shader code to change specific things on the runtime. For example, if you don't want camera, if you don't want like if you want to add lighting to a specific object and things like that, that's its capability basically. On runtime, altering the shader code is basically what shader builder does. Um, does that solve the question or yeah, I think so. And then I guess maybe just adding on to that, because I'm thinking like um so I know in Valorin we have uh hot reloading of shaders, and I think this is important. So like in settings you can change um if you want one way of doing lighting or a different way of doing lighting or just anything else in um graphical settings if you want that changed out uh but i i don't know if that's um like changing different i, I don't think it's changing different variables in the like the the shader file but instead it's like literally just saying okay we're now using this shader but what you're saying is more like when you want to template different variables and or when you want to pass stuff in at runtime mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pretty much like macros, but for shaders and <laughs> something nice. like that. Okay, super cool, super cool. Um, another thing, I was kind of, well, I don't even know if it's a question, but the sort of like the, the resource system that you were mentioning and like the way to like reference it, um, it definitely makes me think of like, so I've used Godot quite a lot and how uh, it, it like uses scenes and how scenes can like point at each other and stuff, stuff like that. Um, and I think for resources, this is a pretty cool idea to be able to like have references that um point to other things uh but i was also wondering like do you think you can extend this to maybe types of game objects that you would have so that you can have some type of like transitive logic across game objects or like build some um architecture pattern around this oh yeah absolutely um i think well, i think ecs would be similar to this because you can like hmm. add a system to all the objects but you can definitely be, definitely move this idea to objects itself like overall to change enemy types and stuff like that the main idea on resource sharing was it was a workaround <laughs> instancing which it now is supported right now but mm -hmm. you can like use it for anything else you want right now it's on resources it can be extended to other things too okay yeah super cool um yeah so i, I think these are some uh pretty awesome updates for for blue engine so um, I don't think I have anything else in chat. Uh, so uh, yeah, Alham, thank you very much for uh, coming in and talking with us. And I hope to see uh, more updates in the future. Thank you as well. I'll see you guys later. Peace. Perfect. And we'll be back in just a minute with Cybersoul. We are back with Andrea, who's going to be talking to us about Cybergate. And so um, I think I, I first saw Cybergate a few months ago, uh, but I'm very excited to sort of hear about its background here, about what it is, um, and get an update uh, from the developer. So Andrea, I'll pass it right over to you. Hi. So the Cybergate is a project, is a child, childhood project that I had like six years ago. And uh, 
it was about like generating a universe with just math and formulas. And uh, there will be there will be like many portals, and you can choose a portal and go to a new universe. And uh, I was very inspired. I was like, I didn't know what to do in life, and uh, and then I think about my my childhood dream, and uh, I started building Cybergate. Um, I looked at many options. I looked at the C plus plus, which I had done before. I looked at JavaScript, those things. But Rust was like a modern mo modern language and had many, it was a very sought out language. Like the features are very well sought out. They are minimalistic and uh, there are not many ways to do a certain thing, which is uh, keeps you very organized. And it's rigorous because uh, the compiler is always checking if, if you are making uh, the good thing, the, the memory, if you are keeping track of the memory, if you're keeping track of the types, and it's very good. So it's very good for indie developers, where the C++, like it will be a big company and many employees, and don't, they don't really care about if it bugs out on the user because they are just a big company. So I really chose Rust because of that. And it's been a long journey on, on Rust. It has been one and a half years. And uh, the game game development Discord has been very good. So yeah, the has been one and a half years. I focused most on networking because um, that was one of the hardest things that I saw. So if I can deal with it, then I'm already pretty decent through my goal. And yeah, then I did the graphics, graphics from scratch on web GPU, which was a, it's an, another it's very hard problem. And I, I kind of made it work, but it's not perfect. And uh, recently I did storage. So I stored the universe and I can upgrade the, the universe on storage, even though the codes change. So there was just a lot of thought put into it. And uh, I also did the, uh, like the player storage itself, which is different than the universe because the universe, you just serialize the entire game state into memory. While the, the player, you have to worry about the transactions and the, uh, it's a completely different way to to keep it persistent so i just did i just i'm very crazy i do things from scratch and uh, uh yeah i just want to show you uh, would you be able to play with me forest would you be able to play if, if we both go i think you're muted well, so I am. Uh, yes, I'd love to. Yeah, I'm popping it open on uh, my browser over here. Yeah, two things that I want to show you from from the previous week has been I, I implemented the rocket launcher with a cool effect. And also I had those creatures, flying creatures. Um, yeah, I made the flying creatures like a demo for, for the universe, even though the, the AI and the, the evolution algorithms that I want to do later that's going to be the end and the product but for now i just have some red creatures flying and they will attack you and there is a day night cycle and then a rage period perfect so okay yeah a recent feature that i did was the the, the flying creature the flying red ball is gonna give some spikes once he attacks you okay yeah, so I have the desktop version, web GPU and Winit, they work everywhere. So it's, it's like, it's for free. Uh, and the, also the, the web. And I did a launcher, a native launcher, so that once you press the launcher, it's going to download all the assets. It's also going to download itself if, if it self updates. And uh, so I can download the launcher, press the download. But recently, in the past two weeks, I did. I, I I ported the the native launcher to the web. So now the web has a launcher itself. It's it's instead of using the file system, it's using the index DB, like a virtual file system. And so we can. Okay, I gotta say I love the uh, the animation right there. Uh, do you have? Oh, thanks. Do you have the? 
Um, I have the uh, the story screen on mine right now. It's just a problem. And this is going to be the launcher. The Firefox on. Um, uh, do I have sound? Can you hear this? Uh, sound sound won't pass through, unfortunately. <laughs> I, uh, I don't. Actually, maybe. Actually, maybe it does on Mac. Um, so yeah, Firefox has some issues with the buy streams, the quick buy streams, but it's kind of reliable. I found a hack for, for it, but sometimes you guys stuck. So yeah, just the basic. Oh, OK, thing. OK. Yeah. I see. I see what you mean. Yeah, I got mine uh, stuck at 114 megs. That, that's actually so cool that you can like ship the game. In, and just out of curiosity, are you, is it like uh, downloading from GitHub or? From No, it's from, from my server. Oh, okay. Okay. Here, so yeah, you can card. you can interrupt the the progress in between. You can reload and you can it keeps it keeps like ten percent of chunks. So if you stop, it, it keeps it, it, it uses the the cache. Okay. Yeah. So he assigns you as a guest account. You don't have to to log in. So that's very easy to just play. And okay. create a awesome. character. And once the character is created, it's gonna it's gonna stay there. We don't have to to actually play. You can just be alive on that universe. Okay. Okay, this is super cool. Um, and in theory, anybody who's uh, watching in the audience right now can can join as well. Just start my stream here. All right, I have both streams going just in case, so we need to stop between either of them. Yeah, Firefox has some issues. Yeah, I just uh, over the It feels super cool that I can just like hop in the browser and be able to pop this open, download it, um, get it going here. And it's like super smooth too. I think this is just like, I got the guest number four as well online. Nice, nice. Yeah, I have no idea why Firefox is not aligning, but I'm trying to call. And I also have the controller with the Gil RS. I use the Gil RS. Nice. <clears throat> I just saw someone get attacked by a big red blob and then fall off the world. Um, and then I too just fell off the world. <laughs> oh, this is a pretty cool map. And there is a there is a lower one. Oh, oh, this one looks a lot more dangerous. <laughs> yeah. So you have you have the bullet. You have the bullet oh, yes, and then nice. uh, the right as the achievement, so you can collect those uh, those balls. Okay. And shoot yes. at blocks. Once you shoot at blocks, you can grab them with the right press of the mouse. Once once you grab them, you release them, and they become solid. So that's how you can build a shelter to protect yourself. And uh, when they skill to the monsters and uh, enter the black hole, the black hole just just teleports you from. From one, from one island to the other island. The next version, I'm going to make it so that he teleports you to another server, to actually another universe. OK, OK. And once, once you achieve all the right side, you're going to get the rocket launcher. And you just press R to change between the rocket launcher and the bullets. But for now, for this dem demo, I'm just I'm using the rocket launcher uh, beforehand. And yeah, I'm playing, I'm playing with the controller right now. Perfect. I'm just going to swap back over to you here. Oh, that's so cool. It's really cool that you can just, yeah, set up a controller in the browser, too, and you're good to go. And um, I'm quite impressed about the rocket launcher effect. I do the, I do the, the particle system when I do, I do the graphics. 
I redid the group. Oh my god, the, the repeat reviews is so nice. My car character John Solo is is not is just a simple dynamic object, so uh, yeah. I don't I don't do any fancy thing with the character control. And actually, well, I mean, you say simple dynamic object, but one thing I'm curious about is how does the um, networking for the game work? And so is it like web sockets or um, t like different types of sockets on the browser? So the, uh, it uses the web transport on the, on the web and use the, the rallied queen for the native. And the, the queen also can, can serve from, the, from a server and output the out to the web transport client. Okay. So that's the spike, the monster spike. Yeah. So I think another thing is that's pretty cool is the monsters um, look very much just like mathematical geometry. Like I think that's a pretty cool uh, way to go about it where um they look like they're I, I imagine procedurally generated enemies yeah it's a vertex it's a vertex shader. <laughs> it looks like, like pretty shader. creepy it's, a, it's like a <laughs> slightly dense sphere with many vertices and then it just goes up it goes inside and out Yeah, so I built the particle system when I built, I built the, the, the render with WebGQ when, when I first started, and it was very rough. I, I did like every uh, every pipeline, I copy paste 100 lines of code. So I had like, oh, actually every model that I had, I like cube every year, I had the pipeline for every model. It was like very bad. And when I, uh, it was like eight months later, I built, the, the, the next one, the next iteration. And I also build the particle system. The, I want to use it this time around, I want to use it more. It was like five months ago when I built the particle system. So I want to build some, some more data reference. And I'm quite impressed with the, the effect. I'm sorry, Andrea, your mic is getting a bit muffled. I'm curious if uh, maybe bending the screen down might have made it a little bit more. Um, Is it better? I think so. Yeah, I do like how, like the different enemy versions, I, I found that I, I was getting chased by a level 30 and then you could kind of just run backwards and uh, sort of get away from it. And so wasn't too, too worrying, but then you have like a horde of them chasing after you. And I think that's like <laughs> probably game over. Um, in chat, someone mentioned the rocket launcher is super satisfying. And I definitely agree. Like when you, you, you put it in your uh, your hand and then you just let it fire, it, it really uh, does some work. I'm afraid it's, it's a little bit too, too intense. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there is the, there's like a sub, like 5,000 particles. It's not a very, it's not like I'm super smart doing a, a very smart thing. It's just a uh, uh, brute force particle. I spawn a bunch of billboards and I spawn the I spawn the smoke and I spawn the there's like six different colors as the orange color and then the different kinds of orange and different kinds of gray. And okay. then there is the explosion. And yeah, the particle system. I can show you next. I can show you the code of the how I use the particle system. But I like, I like how how it's set up. I built it five months ago, and I, I was very impressed by how I can brute force and make a very cool effect.
yeah, we can uh, we can take a look at the the code maybe. Sure. So that's that's the code of the <clears throat> have like a graphics graphics uh, the the client the client viewer the client how he views the universe and uh, this is the particle effect of the the rocket so trailing particle effect and uh, <clears throat> yeah I'm just very happy how it's how it's set up I just create a model for the billboard. And here how is how I set as these are several generators. The color is a so every every attribute has a generator and I can choose either a random there's a base and the variance can be a default just zero and can also be or can be fixed and can be a customized. I'm not sure if I can see here, but it can it can be customized with your own function. Okay. And uh, for this one, for the trailing effect, it's a it's a state. It's not a it's not based on the quantity. Like if you wanna give like one thousand particles and then you are done, it's based on the quantity. But here is just a state. It's it's continuous and there's just a timer. And uh, you need to keep it alive because it's a state. And these are the colors. So the ignition and the burning fuel, etc. Mm -hmm. And it just uh, interpolates between the colors here. Yeah, I like the uh, use of Rust enums there to sort of be able to specify how you want a number to be defined, um, or like whether you want it to be like a random number or like a static number or anything. Um, mm -hmm. And so if I'm not mistaken, I, I believe you're using Bevy. Is that correct? Oh, no, it's just my own my own thing. My own. OK, OK. Yeah, I saw something with uh, an ECS at the top. And so I think I made an assumption there. But um, are you the, using? I use the X. Oh, OK, <laughs> nice. Um, and I then use... everything else you, you said you were building on top of WGPU? Yeah. OK. I use the um, main ones I use is the X, the Queen, the WebGPU, the Winnet. I use the Yakui for the for the interface. I also use the Igoi for the menu. I just yeah. wanted to try out something new, but Yakui is, is good, very good. And the Borch, I use Borch for the for the networking because I because it has the lowest bytes. For my use case, there's the lowest bytes. OK, wait, so Borsch um, binary representation serializing for hashing. Oh, OK, OK. So um, so like the passing information over it, you find to be like the um, least data? Yeah, for the for my kind of networking. Uh -huh. Thank goodness we have uh, Serde and like a whole bunch of different implementations of um, data type or data, I, not data types, but data serialization methods. Um, and we could just like swap between them and figure out which one's the uh, fastest or slow or the smallest or anything. Yeah, the networking that I do, maybe I can talk more about how, how I do it. Yeah, I think we could uh, do a few minutes of that. Yeah, so there is the the most popular, the every, every cause, like an object does something is based on the cause. And so you, you, you send all the causes to the client so they can replicate and they can predict the, they can predict the object movements object. Um, and then there is another one called, it's, it's like the object streaming. So the server just calculates everything and streams the output. So they are very different. There is the causal, sends the cause and send the output and the, I, I do the streaming because I plan to have uh, like a universe with, with artificial intelligence. And it's not possible to, to send all the causes of the artificial intelligence. Like the clients cannot even have enough memory to run the, the artificial intelligence model. So that's mm -hmm. why I went to, to the streaming method. And the streaming method, 
uh, you need to be very efficient how you send the data. Like sending sending the positions, you need to just send uh, like one or two bytes for the. And you, you need to create a priority based networking so that some update 10 times every frame, other uh, every one second, other updates 100 times. You need to be very, um, very conservative. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons that Borch works very well for me. Okay, interesting. And so if I understand correctly, you have um, sort of like two different pieces of networking that can be passed back and forth. And so the streaming things are about just data that's happening in the world at any point. And then you also have like another network stream that is focused on um, if you do any inputs or any anything else that is happening as like an event sort of. Yeah, sure. Base event based. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. So I, I think this has been like a, a super cool look into Cybergate, and so I think uh, I definitely want to see see uh, more updates. I, I know you post quite often on your Discord server about um, different progress to the game and different showcases and stuff like that. Is that a good place to go and find out what's happening? Yeah, we do every month. We do a testing phase with the work that I that I made I, and put up in that month. Yeah. Um, and just out of curiosity as well, how many, like, what, what's like the most amount of people you've ever had online at once? Oh, uh, like mm, eight people, 10 people. Nice. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I think. But um, I, wish, I wish I can do some, some stress tests, like 100 or something. <laughs> Yeah, um, it's it's a lot of fun when you can get like a yeah like a, a big group of people online uh, and kind of just see how stuff goes. But I think um, to see this even as like a, a place for several people to go online, like a, like a friend group to go and like play a party in in uh, Cybergate, seems like there's like quite a lot of potential for that. And so I'm definitely excited to see uh, as it grows what uh, what its potential is. Yeah. All right. Well, Andrea, thank you so much for coming and talking to us about uh, Cybergate. And I hope to uh, see you in a future month to uh, catch up on other things that are happening. Yeah, nice. Nice to talk. Cheers. Finally, for today, we are back uh, with the, the final speaker. So uh, Kevin or Kate Preet is going to be talking to us about uh, no STD. Um, we were talking the other day about what would be uh, cool to go over. And uh, Kate Preet mentioned this. And I am super excited because uh, I don't know a ton about no STD. And so, uh, Kevin, I'll let you take it away. Oh, I think you're muted there. Ah, thank you. Um, so this talk was actually inspired by what I've been doing recently in, uh, due to having acquired my, uh, my pre-order of the Panic Playdate, which is a tiny little, you know, oddball games console. The big feature, the big feature being it, ha it has a crank on it. So I'm always a sucker for weird input devices. So I am. Uh, so I said, you know, well, can I port my game to it? And, you know, this being, of course, this being a, of course, a, a well, it's not no operating system. It's a weird operating system. So, you know, and, and it's got, you know, this, this, this um, one bit LCD that, you know, reflective. So, see, you know, people like to compare it to the Game Boy. But anyway, so that project did not go out well because it turned, because, uh, um, well, Problems not yet debugged is that say it's the 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 only error message I get is a stack overflow, which I'm not sure that's actually accurate. So, but I did a lot of preliminary work, and I'm going to tell you about why this might be an interesting thing to do 
even if you are not planning to port your game to a weird console. Um, right. So first, the first question I want to is, what does no standard mean? It means writing code without some of Rust standard library. Not all, some. The because, you know, let's see. And so it's not as restrictive as you might think. Now, why would you care about this? Like, isn't no standard for, you know, embedded folks? Well, yeah. the one basic reason is simply increased platform compatibility. It means that, as I just mentioned, you can you can port your you can port your game to consoles, to to weird platforms, to retro platforms. You know, Rust will go all the way down to 16-bit processors. And, and you know, like may, maybe you're just interested in running your game on the web, and it turns out that the current state of Rust Wasm is kind of weird. It has it's a, has the standard library, has some of the standard library. So if you can just skip all of that part, that then you won't run into problems. Or you can be interested in it for the sake of loose coupling. If you use no standard in your in one of your crates, then that means that you can know that that is not doing any I/O. It is only doing computation, and that is a constraint which can be useful for structuring your program so that it is, you know, more testable, more adaptable to again different platforms, and it can you know it, it's an it's, it's an architectural constraint which can be useful. And finally, if you have something that is a is a library that could be used elsewhere, then I encourage you to make that library, you know, no standard compatible because it will, you know, it means that it will run everywhere. Well, there's a couple of asterisks on that everywhere. Um, but, you know, and, you know, even if you haven't written a library, are you sure you, are you, well, sorry. Sorry, wrong points. So this discussion is mainly about libraries because in the end, your binary or, you know, if you're for some reason, you know, compiling your code into a dynamic library, it's going to interact with the environment somehow. So, but, so we're talking about the subset of the code, which can just interact with other Rust code. I've always found, you know, this is just a library to be a very useful constraint to enforce because it, you know, it, it, it nails down, you know, which things are going to interact with the rest of the world with versus everything else. So, and if you don't have a, if you don't have a library, are you sure you don't have a library? There are lots of cases where you, where you end up with a module of your system that, you know, it could be a library. And now you shouldn't necessarily do this all the time because, you know, Creating a separate library is a constraint that that will you know it will give you more maintenance work, but you know than not doing that. But you know, well sometimes sometimes we want to sometimes we we like the idea for whatever reason or another. So I'm not telling you you should do this. I'm saying that if you have a library, consider making it no standard. So let's talk about how to actually do this. The easy parts of this are. Most of what you want from the standard library is just in core. You know, that is, so the the Rust, the, sorry, the Rust standard library is broken into three Rust crates. Those crates are co called core, alloc, and standard. Standard re-exports all the stuff from all the other crates. So you, if you are only familiar with standard, that's because it includes the rest. So the first step on the path to no standard is, just change your imports, change your use, so that it says use core instead of use standard. And there's lots of things that you can do this with. There's, um, you know, the like your basic types, like you know your your string slice, your 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 numbers, you know, the traits like iterator and debug. All of those things are in core. Again, there's even stuff that is for that is, is suitable for, you know, interior mutability. E stuff like cell and ref cell and even atomics. You you think about atomics as being thread safety things, but they're in core. Again, even future is in core. You can write asynchronous programs, you know, as long as you skip the executor part. 
then we can now that's the part that's all the stuff that the stuff that is in core is the stuff that works even if you do not have an allocator but in most cases you're going to have problems that are complex enough that you want an allocator and which and also the alloc crate is for it contains interfaces for the allocator and it contains the types which require an allocator so it contains so we have string we have box of course we have vec we have you know cow because it has the oven version you, you formatting to to string is in alloc because it requires it has b tree map you know which you so the annoying part here is that hash map is not in alloc but you can use b tree map or we'll get to other options later and you can even have reference counting in alloc so there's a lot of stuff that you can do that you might have thought that you can't do just with you know with no standard and finally you can ask clippy to help you perform this migration there's these two lints which will tell you whenever you have an import that could be written with core or could be written with alloc now what right now clippy does not will not automatically fix these for you but a change for that is coming up in the upcoming rust release i actually asked for it and they somebody implemented it. yay for open source so next we have the less easy parts So you you do not get to spawn threads because spawning threads is about talking to the operating system and that so that's in standard and it's not in core it's not in alloc. But if you can rephrase your problem, then you will. Be, then you may be able to do so, to make things convenient anyway. So one obvious answer is you can write async functions and provide them to the provide them to the user of your library and just let the user of the library set up to run those functions, async functions concurrently. So, you know, async is a great, and sometimes sometimes you don't even need threads. Sometimes you just want to do, two, you just want to do two things and async, you know, async combinators allow you to do things concurrently, but not in parallel. That is, you know, multitasking on a single processor. And in fact, if you actually want to run on you know, embedded platforms like, you know, this here is a single core device. So you have to use, you know, and the operating system doesn't give you th threads. So, you know, you have to use cooperative multitasking. You know, lots of great software has been written that way. Don't knock it. Or you can try to express your problem in, you know, the, you know, iterators. Do it the way the functional folks like, you know, try. And then when you, we, if your problem is shaped like that, then you can say that, you can do things like if the standard library is available, then you can also use Rayon for parallel iterators. So again, another approach to, you know, to getting at parallelism without necessarily baking it into your your system. Though Rayon does not have it, Rayon is not itself no standard compatible, so it's something you have to you know do a bunch of work to optionally use. And finally, there is the most simple option, which is to just say, you know, you prov your library provides algorithms and doesn't care about scheduling, and it's the caller's responsibility, it's the dependent's responsibility to use your algorithms. That's ma maximally flexible, but it means that you may you it can mean that you're exposing more of your structure to your caller, and that's always a constraint to think about because it means that you know, can you what can you change in the future without breaking the API? Of course, if you're writing a library for internal use, then you don't care about breaking your API. That's a perfectly fine thing to do. But you know, if you want to publish your okay. Um, another problem is you will be missing some floating point functions. If you're writing a game, you've probably got some uses for sine and cosine, and you'll find that those methods are missing. The answer, however, the you can simply use libm, which is Libm is just a Rust crate which implements these, you know, algorithms for you know transcendental functions and all that, you know, without using any non-Rust code like the standard library does. And furthermore, I, here's an interesting trick. So numtraits library contains traits that are used for you know being generic over numeric stuff, but the numtraits float trait, or so, well, actually you want float core as it's called uh, is that right no sorry i don't think that's right but anyway you can you, you can use num trait you can import the num traits float trait and get back and as long as you've enabled the libm feature you can get back all of those floating point functions with exactly the same interface so if you just conditionally import that then you can use either standard library or you can use you know local re-implementation of it. And so that's not really a problem at all. It's just one of those things that you have to, they have to do. 
Another annoying part is hash map. So the standard library does not include, so the standard crate includes hash map, but Alec does not. And this is for the, the you know, reason, the slightly annoying reason that while the standard library hash map uses randomness to randomize its hash functions, which is great for you know, design the service protection, but it means that hash map isn't present in alloc. And it would be nice if hash map was present in alloc because you can just, you can just swap out the hasher, but for, you know, for, you know, <laughs> architectural reasons that can't, isn't actually happening. So for now, your choices are, one, you can use the hash brown library, which you may have heard of as this is the hashing implementation the standard library uses, and that's actually true. But you can, if you use hash brown directly, then you get to use it without that without that system dependency, and you'll get exactly the same interface. Of course, the problem is if you want to have a hash map in your library's public API, well, now you have a problem. But you know, usually you don't actually have to do that. And finally, you can also use B-tree map. B-tree map is again, it's a map. It has basically the same interface as hash map except that it uses sorting instead of hashing. So your your key type has to implement ORD as opposed to your key type has to implement hash. And so and this can actually be useful for game development because B-tree map is deterministic. It, it always presents its keys in sorted order. And it also can do, you can also query it by ranges. So you can say, give me the keys, you know, from here to there. And that, and so it can be useful for some other purposes. So, you know, Take a look at it. now. It, the reason that we don't use B-tree map by default is that it can be less efficient than hash than hash maps because it requires traversing a tree, which is you know more in directions, more pointer lookups than a hash map by default. But again, you know, if you if you care about the performance, you know, benchmark it and see what you get. And a, a small B-tree map doesn't have very many levels, so it can be fine. It's just not constant time like a hash map is. Um, the next thing that you might miss out on is atomics. Now, so if you've ever written code that, you know, generates, you know, 64-bit global counters, then, well, you may find that, oh, this platform does not support 64-bit atomics, so you can't, you know, assign those unique IDs. So, you know, you might have to, you might have to change something and say, okay, well, 32 bits will do, and we'll check it for overflow or something. Um, but there are parts that, potentially could give you a lot of trouble. So think of this this part of the talk as the list of things that you may want that may turn put you off doing this entirely. Send and sync. You know, in Rust we love our thread safety. Uh, but in if you do no standard, you have several you you lose several things from the standard sync module such as, you know, mutex, rw lock, you know, all those things and and MPSC, all those things that you know just let you have interthread communication or you know sharing that that works. Now remember, ARC is available, so you don't have to give up sharing be things between threads. You only have to give up the the synchronization parts. So this is this is trouble if you want interimmutable objects that are thread safe, but you know maybe you don't need any interior mutability that's you know it's always a good thing to not you keep that to a minimum but sometimes there are problems where, where that's the best solution so you know finally if you have if you have callbacks and those callbacks are like you know box dine you know some trade object then you have then you have a problem because when you use when you use trade object you have to specify is this send and sync or is this not send and sync and so, and so the, 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 there's a catch here. So a lot of this problem can be, so, you can solve this by saying, okay, my library is going to have a feature and it's going to either use the standard library or it's going to, you know, not offer send and sync. And you can do that. The catch is if you're accepting a callback, you can't make, the, if you make that conditional, now you've done what we call a non-additive feature, which is to say that if you, if somebody, if you have, you know, two dependents on your library, one of them activates the feature and one of them is expecting to be able to pass a non, a non-sync callback, then the one stops the other from compiling. So you really want to think carefully about, you know, what do you want to do in this situation if it comes up? But of course, a lot of code doesn't need any of those callbacks. And if your callback is generic, you know, if it says, you know, if it's, you know, generic over F, which implements function and so on, then you don't have to worry about this because the, you know, auto trait leakage will means that, you know, the, the compiler will just accept the things that are valid and 
reject the things that aren't. You don't have to choose one or the other. Let's see. Another catch is, is if you have any kind of global lazy initialization or global caching, those are also those are also those generally depend on mutex or something like mutex, you know, and those are also not available. So if you want to, if you want no standard, then you have to leave those out of your library. Again, you can think about this as let the caller have choice of, you know, what policy to enforce. On the other hand, you know, there are things where it's clearly just, you know, lazy initialization. Language. Well, maybe you can initialize that at compile time, you know, kind of stuff is, you know, can be pretty powerful. So things to think about. Um, I got a, saw a question. Somebody asked, you know, can you use thread locals? And the answer, as I understand it, is no. Or again, you can, there may be a way to have thread locals if there are even threads, but it will be platform specific, you know, because that's what you're giving up with no standard. You're, go, you're giving up all the things that involve talking to the platform. And so thread locals are one of the things that you can't do. Um, right. Let's see. Okay. Another annoying thing. The the error trait is in standard, it is not in core. This is light, widely regarded to be a mistake, but it hasn't been fixed yet. There's work in that. But for now, if you were defining error types, you have to skip the error trait. Now, this isn't as terrible as it sounds because the error trait doesn't actually do much itself. Most of what an error being an error means is it implement well. The error trait says this has to implement debug and this has to implement display, and you can do that separately. And if you're using the if you're using the this error macro, try, take a look at display doc instead. It does basically the same thing. But if you have chained errors, you know the the source method, then you're then you're going you're going to have to give that up. And this might be fine because you know because in the cases where somebody actually wants to not use the standard library, then they're probably customizing their error handling anyway, because as you know, exit to desktop is often not an option in those kinds of situations. So it may be fine, but it's another thing that you have to deal with that. It, and someday we won't probably won't have to. Let's see. Another hazard is, is dependencies of your code that could be no standard, but aren't. Because so because one of the reasons I'm giving this talk is a lot of people don't even think about you know no standard support or, but so maybe you can just get send them a patch and take care of it or maybe it'll be more troublesome you might have to find you might have to find some other other libraries or you might give up and again maybe you don't actually want to go through all this bother maybe you really don't want to abstract away all of your io from your main code and i'm sure everyone knows about you know you read game processing you felt the urge to you know combine your rendering and your game logic even because it's very extremely convenient and efficient even though they're logically separated concepts you know so that that kind of thing can push towards well don't introduce these abstraction layers don't make a mess and you know, even getting the current time is an I.O. operation. It's going out to some hardware that's mediated by the operating system to say, tell me what time it is. So you, you don't have system time, you don't have instant. And so if you're doing self-profiling, that could be really annoying. So I went ahead and gone and abstracted it, and it went pretty well. But again, it's one of those things that's kind of, that's kind of bothersome. So you may not want to do this, or maybe this may this sounds like a fun challenge and you're going to do it anyway. So let's get to how to make it happen. This is so I've looked over a bunch of different ways to do this, and this is my opinion on how best you should do it. So if your crate simply has no unit tests, is it, we'll get to why testing is important in a moment. Then you can do the most, you know, the most uh, brute force thing is just saying, okay, we declare no standard, which means your crate doesn't it means you, your crate doesn't implicitly link to standard, and it means it doesn't implicitly import the standard prelude. It, in, in, impl, it imports the core prelude instead, which has fewer things in it, like it doesn't have string in it, for example. And then you want, and then you usually want to say to declare alloc because you want to be able to access alloc now. The reason that, by the way, the reason that you have to say extern crate here is because, well, once upon a time, you had to declare extern crate for all your dependencies. The reason you have to do it here is because these dependencies are not managed by cargo. 
That might change in the future, but for now, they're not managed for cargo. Cargo does nothing about whether or not your crate is linking to the standard library. So if you want to use one of the unusual crates here, which alloc is one is basically the only one we care about here, then you have to declare it explicitly. So th this is, you know, this is think of this as what you do here instead of you know, adding a link to your dependencies list. Now. If your crate has tests, those tests probably depend on the standard library. They, you know, because you, and, or even, and even if they do, even if, even if they don't necessarily, you probably want to use things like VEC and so on for, you know, collecting data and then, you know, comparing it with some, asserting about it and so on. So we want to change this a little bit. We want to say, if we are not compiling tests, then this is a no standard library crate. So a, a small complication and, when you compile for your tests of your library, Cargo will still compile the library itself, you know, without the test configuration set. So you still get testing that your crate compiles with no standard. This is just when compiling the tests themselves, you know, it will it you will be able to use all the usual standard features. And and you could skip this, but I recommend doing it because it's. It's a lot less annoying than otherwise. You, you don't really want to have to be writing lots of imports in every test module you have. However, there are a lot of ways that you can complicate these things and, you know, and make it so that you have more mess of imports than you could really need. So here's the common things that I've seen that I recommend that you don't do. Do not... If, you, if your library has a use the standard library feature, as many, many Rust libraries do, do not make your no standard conditional on that feature. It's the, pro, the reason is now you're changing what the prelude is. You're changing what's in scope based on this condition, and that makes your code more fragile. Instead, just extern create standard. That, you know, do that conditionally. That, uh, that makes, makes everything much more regular. And don't conditionally change which things you're importing from where. If something is in core and in standard, you can import it from core even if you're using standard. You do not have to make things conditional. You do not have to rename one alloc as standard or something like that in order to make things compatible. Don't do this because then you then you will be surprised by oh this this entry doesn't act, doesn't actually exist. You can always use the core crate. You can always use the alloc crate under all conditions. You do not have to avoid them if you are using a standard. So that's how you declare it up front now. But here's the question. You have existing code. How do you migrate it? Here's a plan. First of all, go through your dependencies. Disable those default enabled standard features. You will find a lot of them. You will find that you don't actually use a lot of them. So just, just go audit your dependencies, go through them and turn them off. And this is a great way to notice if there's any dependencies that will be more troublesome. Then add those lints I mentioned, which will tell you if your imports are unnecessarily using standard and fix them. Then you will probably find that you have some dependencies which, you know, unconditionally depend on the standard library. I, I myself was using a vector math library which unconditionally depended on the standard library, so I had to change to a different one. That was that was super annoying, but maybe you won't be in that position. You will, but you know, this is a great way of thinking about you. Know, do you really need that dependency? And sometimes the answer will be yes. Again, this is a point at which you may say this is not for you, but you know. You, what you want to do is you remove these dependencies and you'll work towards the question is, does your no standard build succeed? I'll talk more about that in the future. But you know, the first thing the first thing that will fail here is your dependencies won't compile. So you, you so fix those first. Now, this is optional. I think it's probably a good idea for your migration work, but you know, introduce a feature into your library which says, you know, do you want to try to use the standard library? The idea here is this gives you a way to have your, your code continue to build and work normally while you work on making it succeed at compiling without that feature enabled. Now, you don't necessarily want to call that feature standard because you know that's a statement about what you're depending on. 
not a statement about what are you offering to your dependents. So maybe maybe what you what you offer under this condition is thread safety, and so you should call this feature sync or 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 whatever else apply. Or maybe you should call it threads or you know just so, so think about think about you know what you're providing, not what you're implementing. Then work towards getting the crate to build with that feature disabled. And this and this is the point at which again you know this you may find that you know okay this is not going to work we give up, but if it do, the use use this feature to be able to incrementally work towards it rather than having to do it in one giant commit to be, uh, because that or breaking your build because those are also both terrible ideas for you know development speed. Then the next step after building in the actual no st standard condition is get the crate to build without on a compilation target on a you know cross compile it to something that doesn't have the standard library. There's a number of you know, embedded targets that you can use for this and rest up can install that for you. So this doesn't require this doesn't require any you know, complexity of your build. It's just another build command. You just see if that see if that works and you you probably will find more things to fix here. Now finally you have a build that works and maybe you maybe you've even tested it the now if that feature you added is not actually providing any value if it doesn't turn on anything that you care about then just delete it because you know the best possible library is one that work that that you don't have to configure that it just works under all conditions so you may find that your library does not need does not ever need the standard library or you might that there's reasons to pick uh well all right. Uh, okay. Now let's talk about testing this uh, this stuff. So remember, just declaring no standard doesn't mean your crate won't attempt to link the standard library. It doesn't mean your dependencies won't attempt to link the standard library because nothing nothing's actually checking that except the linker so you need you need to build check your build use a target that doesn't have the standard library and therefore is guaranteed to fail if you use this if you use standard so the command for, so you usually you know so you'll run your cargo check and you it will have you know no you'll have no default features so probably assuming because if you have a feature you don't need to if you don't have a feature that and you don't ever depend on the standard library that but just specify a compilation target which doesn't have the standard library this is an example one this is the target that you use if you were compiling for the play date and it's very common for you know modern embedded systems to be using you know you know th th this is a flavor of arm basically and you know so it might be something like that or it might be some v6 or whatever but just just pick one of them and continue with them though there are some reasons that you might want to pick one a specific one um so if you're wondering why is one of your dependencies depending on the standard library then and this is a very common problem because you know these dependencies can be pretty tricky what you want to do is use the cargo tree command which prints out the tree of dependencies so and then you want to customize which edges of the dependency graph it's showing you say features which means don't just show which dependency which crate depends on which other crate show which features are being enabled because you want to spot those standard features that you wanted that you wanted disabled fine also specify normal now normal means just plain normal dependencies <laughs> In particular, it doesn't include build dependencies and it doesn't include testing dependencies. So by specifying this explicitly, you actually hide all the build dependencies, which you don't care about for this purpose, because builds, of course, always happen on the host and hosts, you know, the, the platform that's ru actually running the compiler. So that you can use. So th this will be this will be a very handy tool to use while you're getting started. Of course, after you get your build work, build, you've got your build working, you don't need to worry about it too much. Okay, and that is everything. Now let me just review what we anybody has asked about. So, so um, and John Farrow was saying, you know, why are these in core instead? What wouldn't it make more, more sense to just always use things from core? And yeah, that's basically that's basically sort of basically the point of my talk. Yes, you can always you can always use core. And if you're wondering about why why rust didn't do that way from the start well 
there's an interesting story there. And that is Rust Rust was not originally in, envisioned for embedded development. Rust originally did not have this three crate split, this three click, this three crate split of of core alloc and standard. It was already originally just standard. That's actually why the Wasm32 unknown unknown target is weird and has a half broken standard. It was invented before core was. <sighs> so if you want to write your code style so that you always use core when core is applicable, perfectly fine to do that. In fact, that's that's sort of, that's almost what I'm encouraging you to do here. But it's the reason it's not part of standard Rust code style is because it it it, it wasn't where we started. And of course, it's annoying to have to think about you know exactly what's in where because like for example, if you've written standard sync you know arc mutex you know because you have you know mutexes in arcs, then though if you wanted to stick to the strict style, you'd have to say use alloc sync arc, use standard sync mutex. So that's that's kind of annoyingly verbose. So reasons not to do that. Um, I see a question about asking about the play date. Um, so let's see. So is it useful for other stuff apart from games? Can you connect a sensor? So the play date is does not have very much input and output. It has so it has let's see it has it has the, its buttons. It has its crank. It has it has it has a microphone. It has headphone output, a speaker. And it has an accelerometer, no gyroscope, no GPS. It has it has Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, but the Bluetooth support is still being worked on. So I would not recommend the Playdate as you know an embedded starter platform unless you're trying to, you know, unless you're, you know, well, it's not, I don't think it's a great way used for a bat as a battery powered shock sensor. You know, there's better there's better equipment for that, and there's better uses for this. The um I'd say the great thing about it is that it, so is like, you know, think about it as, you know, game dev under constraints. So this is a black and white screen and it's very high resolution, but it's black and white. So you, so you get to have fun with, you get to have fun with dithering and, or, but it's, but it, but it is, it is high resolution. This is, this is like, you know, twice the resolution of your, of your classic Game Boy. So, you know, so it, but, but if you try to target this, you know, the, the lesson that I learned right is, you know, yes, remember, there is not much processor on here. There's a 200 megahertz or something like that, single core. So, which is a lot, well, which is a lot compared to once upon a time. But, you know, I, what I'm talking about here is this is, you like, you can do, you know, I'm encouraging you to do this when it is easy. Actual embedded development is doing this, uh, or, you know, small system development is, you know, doing this when it's hard. So, you know. Pick your challenges. I think I see another question coming up. So I have a question that I was yeah. typing up, but I think I can just like sort of ask instead. Um, and and so what so what it sounds like to me is that no STD focuses a lot on not making any presumptions about the hardware it's on. Yeah. Um, not focus anything like that. So once you have say like that base layer what's it look like to go a level above like let's say for example you're writing something for the play date and you wanted to add functionality for i, I don't know, like the buttons or the sensors or like maybe like the, the cpu that it has well, um so okay there, there's two different activities here like one of them is like writing bindings okay you know and that's just that's basically just like just like you would do if you wanted to use a c library you know you would you you look at the api you maybe you take your header files and run them through bind gen or something and you write a rust you write a you know some amount of adapter code that makes the code makes it more rusty to use you know it's like you know put all the unsafe behind safe interfaces so it's so fundamentally adding operating system interfaces or hardware interfaces isn't that much different from you know foreign function you know FFI code you know C library code. There, it's it's the it's the same problem fundamentally. It's just it just has different flavor. But I I'm not very I'm not very familiar with the actual practice of doing that, so I can't say much. I just say it's it's not a hard problem. It's an annoying one, and it's one where you're going to have to deal you know probably have to debug some crashes and so on. So you know the thing I'm focusing on here is you. Know, Supposing that you have your bindings already, how are you going to get your code to work on to compile under these conditions? And 
you know, if you if you take the approach that I'm talking about here, which is where you write a, a pure Rust library that's also no standard, then this is about writing the part of the code that doesn't care about the platform. And this may mean that you have to define, you know, you know, define functions or traits or something that is, you know, this is an this is a gap to be filled with the with the platform interface. And so it's useful to know what the platforms you're targeting are like in order to design that interface. Because if you des if you don't know, you may find that you design it wrong. You know, the classic the classic things like, you know, you know, oh no, you know, this the function takes a callback, but the callback can't return an error. You know, you've, you've been in that situation, or this can't be async, you know. So so think you want to think about those things. So actually, I'll mention that. So um so one, so so one of the reasons that you might I mentioned that you know, one of the reasons I want you might want to do this is like to to follow the you know you know, to follow the sans IO paradigm. And so what this is is the idea that your code should not contain any the like the the, the the classic case where you'd want to do something like this is, for example, a a network protocol implementation. If you're implementing a network protocol, it's often useful to not to to just express it in terms of you know parsing and generating and avoid actually doing the socket calls because this means that then for example in in for a Rust specific example then that you can have either you can then that code can then be used either synchronous or asynchronous or you know or for example, you know, if you avoid, you know, the standard library networking interfaces, then that means that it can also be used on embedded because because the embedded doesn't have a standard library, has a probably has a weird sort of TCP stack or something if it even has one. You know, or maybe you want to actually communicate over Bluetooth instead. So there's lots of reasons to separate your algorithms from the way they interact with the outside world. And so I, sorry, I forget where I where we got here from. But what I'm saying is that doing this separation is a good place to start if you want to do embedded development, because it means that you you know if you have this separation, it means that you can test your code on you know on your host with all of your debugging tools, you know all of your testing tools, rather than being stuck at you know okay I, okay like it says okay I have a, a crash report here it says Stack Overflow okay that's all the information I have not not helpful. Yeah. You know, so yeah. So it's always um, good. so so it's always good to make your code portable between where you care about and your best dev environment. Mm -hmm. I, I think these are some really good points, and I, I really like how uh, sort of you, you've broken it down into um, separating out where this sort of entire talk sits, or like where where no STD sits. Because in my mind, of I haven't really done no STD before. It, very much in my brain is like, why would I want to use no STD? I want to have a programming language to use. But then what it's actually like is uh, you use no STD and you have a lot of stuff from the programming language still, I mean, pretty much everything. Uh, there's some things that you don't have. Um, but it's, it's also right. very similar to how we see, I, I think, unsafe. A lot of people look at it and say, why would I use unsafe? I want Rust to be a safe thing. And it's like, no, no, no. You just There's a few things that you get access to and a few things that change. It's not, you don't lose I mean, the language. Th that, of course, that that perspective, there's, there is something you said for that, that perspective. Like, I think it's a good place to start because, you know, a lot of people that do write unsafe, like, Writing unsafe requires a very, a very certain kind of careful thinking about the problem. And I think it is correct for most people to say, okay, I'm going to avoid that. Now, that's not the same thing as using libraries which contain unsafe. But, but yeah, but I think that absolutely you should, you know, skip unsafe until you have it. But why, I guess why I'm, why I want to emphasize about this, you know, this concept of choosing to use no standard is that's the, it's kind of like it's in the opposite direction of using unsafe. Using unsafe is depending on more platform details, you know, often, and it, and and it's you know it's 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 another it's a thing that you have to maintain harder. Whereas if you are, whereas you know, no standard code is a writing no standard code that isn't platform specific is about saying I I depend on fewer things, fewer things have to be true for my code to work. Mm -hmm. yeah now and again like i'm a big fan of you know 
writing an abstraction, even when it's not necessary, not strictly necessary. So I, you know, I tend to write libraries because that, that modularity to me, that helps me say, you know, okay, I have solved this problem and tucked it away in this box. Now I don't have to think about it as much, but on the other hand, you know, too much modularity can mean that you, you know, you, you, you're standing on top of a teetering tower of abstractions and you're not actually getting your game written. You know? <laughs> Yes. So that's so true. So 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 you know, don't let this stand in the way of writing your game by saying if you find yourself you having a library, if you're going to publish it anyway, and do give that a thought, you know, let people reuse your work, then consider making that library no standing. Yeah. Um, one thing that just came up in chat that I think is a pretty good way of thinking about it. Um, I think the way to, or I think the idea is to move the dependency on STD and hence the platform as far up the depend dependency as tree as possible. Yeah, that, that's what they're looking at. Um, I think I might have lost the video a little bit there, or maybe it's on my end. It could be on my end. Wait, is it my end? One sec, let me check the uh, live footage here. Oh my gosh, I'm gone. Oh, wait, I'm back. Can you hear me? Uh, sounds good to me, but. Okay, I think I think I got, uh, I don't know, let me froze for a second. Okay. Um, yeah, I think uh, that's it for questions. Um, is there anything else you want to cover before we call it? Nope, I think we've got it all. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for this talk. This was a ton of fun. And like, there's like an insane amount that I didn't know. And so, uh, yeah, this was like a really good view into uh, why you might want to consider no STD um, and also some of the constraints that you'd come across in different platforms. And so, um, Kevin, thank you so much uh, for this talk. And I hope that um, we can get you back in a future month to talk about some other uh, cool stuff that you're working on. Well, I mean, hopefully someday somebody will see stuff running on this. And if not, you know, I'll, I'll probably have something else. Perfect. Well, um, I'm definitely very excited to see it. And so, um, yeah, so that, that's it for today's uh, Game Dev Meetup. Um, and we will see everybody next month. Thank you.